Hi, um, lovely to see so many of you here today. We're going to be talking about therapeutic parenting difference in fostering today. And I know that some of you may be adopters or special guardians or birth parents. We will cover those in other uh, presentations, but today we're concentrating very much on fostering. Um, so um, that's, that's what we'll be talking around tonight and taking questions about that later on. So welcome to all of you. Um, so first of all, we just wanted to reassure you, for those of you that haven't seen any of our training before, that we do have a rough idea of what we're talking about. So Dylan, do you want to just explain why you have a clue uh, before me? Mm. Oh yeah, well I have a little bit of a clue. Apart from the fact I actually was a foster child, uh, many, many years ago, I've had four foster homes, four children's homes, and because of my last foster mum, I'm sort of all right, not too bad. Um, I'm also an attachment therapist for a, a couple of foster agencies, um, a number of foster agencies indeed. Uh, I'm also, yeah, I'm a, a co-author alongside Sarah Nation, Jane Mitchell, with some of our therapeutic parenting books, um, and also a keynote speaker. So yeah, and, and I work with uh, foster parents all over the country most days. Hmm. Yes, and in fact this morning you were speaking to people in Australia, weren't you? Which was I like, was, yeah, I did a conference to, I did a conference to foster parents in Australia at the crack of dawn this morning <laughs> because of course they're 23 hours ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, thanks Sarah. So um, we, we always, our training is very popular because we come from a place of authenticity so everything we do is based on our experience and as it says on the introduction we have walked in your shoes so Sarah's walked in your shoes uh, at your children's shoes actually uh, and I've walked in your shoes as, as foster parents so I'm a therapeutic parent and foster uh, a former foster parent and um, an adopter and you will see that picture of my lovely five children with Rosie there uh, on the right and obviously all happily grown up now and no longer living at home hence my um, happy face uh, because uh, I, I do I do understand that you know we have our challenges and much as I love them I'm very pleased that they are now living independently. Relevant to this evening though is that before I adopted my children I fostered um, I started fostering many years ago uh, over 30 years ago uh, in the days when they were not supervising social workers and I used that experience later on to help me set up and run a fostering agency and the agency was Ofsted Outstanding because what we did we did things very differently and we put in what I knew foster parents needed in order to you know keep hold of the children and to, to stay sane really so everything we've done has been based on that experience and I think that that makes a huge difference so we're very passionate about getting it right for children and getting it right for you because I think we all know don't we that there's loads, <coughs> of restrictions, loads of rules rightly so to make sure our children are safe mm. but sometimes we think that the foster parents are forgotten about we tend to talk about being a therapeutic foster parent rather than a foster carer. Um, and the reason for that is because um, carers, uh, as come from our, the children that we look after, carers tend to go off shift. I'm, I'm pretty confident that if you're fostering, you're, you're not going off shift anytime soon. Um, and what was it one of the children said to you, Sarah, about um, their foster parent being called a, a carer? Well, they said about dementia, something about dementia. Oh yes, carers, carers look after carers look after people with dementia, <laughs> and that's what they'd said. And if you think about it, our children don't just need caring for; they need reparenting. Re it's a very specialist uh, role that you have in mm -hmm. reparenting children from trauma. The other thing is that we don't ever call children placements; we call them children, because and children don't need placements; they need families so we're very strong about uh, the language that we use and, and for a reason because we really want our children to belong and and we don't want them moving all around the system and so um now uh, although sarah and i work with many different fostering and adoption agencies throughout the uk and indeed overseas 
We're very involved specifically with two therapeutic parenting fostering agencies, one in England and one in Wales. Mm -hmm. And we use everything that we learn, everything that foster parents tell, them, tell us they need. And we, we really devise tools and put those in place. So you'll hear about those later on. So first of all, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about what is standard fostering, because, you know, I, I hear about this sometimes and it always I'm afraid it makes me smile. Um, and I wonder how many of you feel that you're doing standard fostering. You know, you have no problems and uh, everything's very straightforward all the time. So. So usually I hear people talk about standard foster fostering when they're thinking about charging. So in reality, in my view, there is no such thing as standard fostering because of how quickly things can change. What do you think, Sarah? I agree completely. I mean, how do we differentiate with our children? Uh, at the end of the day, trauma is trauma. I really don't think we can ever say there's standard fostering and neither should we. Mm. Um, often it's about fees, isn't it, Sarah? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, uh, fostering <clears throat> is a very specialist task. Uh, those of you that fostering will, will definitely know this. Um, and every child uh, needs your thought, your care, your reflection, your empathy and your planning. There, there's not really a child around who just decides they might like to go into foster care for a few days and they're yeah, securely attached and they have no issues. Your children will have developmental trauma for sure. So therefore they need therapeutic parenting fostering. Um, so I, I haven't met the child yet that could go into what other people would call a standard placement. We, we yeah. don't know of that. Um, and that's because it's not possible nowadays for a child to get into the care system without suffering some kind of trauma, is it, Sarah? No, I agree completely. In fact, it, you know, long gone are the days when a child would come into care because their parent was giving birth and going into hospital. You know, you really, it takes a lot to get a kid into care these days uh, because it costs a lot of money to have children in foster care. And, um, and so because of that impact of trauma, you know, the children are often very traumatised. There's been a long time often spent with birth families before there's been an intervention. So when mm. they come in, you know, I always talk about the fact they come with their invisible suitcase with, you know, lots of trauma that you might not see on the surface, but absolutely it's there. Mm. And, and you've got to be equipped to manage it. Absolutely. And what you just said just now, um, Sarah, this is where I mostly hear about it. And I believe in, uh, well, Sarah and I are both very straight talkers. Um, I, I believe that mainly people talk about standard fostering and therapeutic fostering in a way to control charges and fees. Um, I, I think that fostering is, is challenging, fostering is difficult, fostering is also very rewarding and you never quite know how things are going to be. So you might have a child of eight who is a dream and you've had no issues for two years and everything's going really, really well. And then something happens mm -hmm. left of centre, you weren't expecting it. And before you know it, you are right back into all the behaviours and all the difficulties that you had maybe at the beginning or maybe you've never seen them before. So that's yeah. why we say, you know, that there's no such thing as standard fostering. Um, sadly, none of my children were ever standard. No, I certainly wasn't standard and I'm still not standard now. <laughs> I could say something here, but I'll desist. Um, generally, what we find is that this, this terminology reflects a, a lack of understanding about trauma in the field. So, so often what we see is with um, unskilled supporting professionals, and I hear I'm talking about teachers, social workers, therapists, um, even you know people who should be supporting you, they might not be professionals, but they might be friends and family or pe teaching assistants, people you would think would, would have a clue. Um, what we often find, although it is getting better, is that there is this lack of understanding about trauma and the impact of trauma on children in the field. So generally speaking, things tend to be minimised quite a lot. You know, the child's doing really well now, and everything's fine, you can therefore only pay you £200 a week, so everything's really easy, that kind of thing. Um, and there's not really this recognition about the triggers and how things can change very, very quickly and how long it takes to help a child to heal. We also see, and Sarah being a therapist, we see this quite a lot, that sometimes an agency will contact us and ask us to go and do training for them. And they tell us they're a therapeutic agency. And we ask, 
why they think they're a therapeutic agency and they say they have a therapist that comes in once a month that does not make you a therapeutic agency uh, it's right. do you want to talk about that a bit Sarah? yeah well it, it's just like putting a plaster over the situation you know unfortunately what you'll often find then is that the therapist is just firefighting uh, mm. situations that are getting out of hand in different families uh, and not really making any lasting changes you know we're dealing with the fruit of the problems rather than addressing the roots and, and, and looking at ways to prevent these situations from occurring. It's so important to recognise as well that the therapist is not going to heal your child. Mm. It's you and it's about you learning to be a therapeutic parent, which a good therapist will help you to do in order for you to come alongside and help your child to heal. Yeah, and, and, and also it depends on like, <coughs> the actual therapist. I mean, we've certainly been in, we, we do a lot of work with um, schools as well. And you know, recently we've did some work with the school where they said, well, you know, we have a, a therapist, who, a play therapist who comes in once a month and the child has play therapy in school. I said, well, that, that, that's actually like really inappropriate. That, that's yeah. you're, you're bringing the therapy into the school and making school an unsafe place. So we have to really challenge this kind of thinking and think mm. about what kind of therapy is this? What kind of help and therapeutic support is there for you mm. as the parent, as the uh, in, uh, in, in loco parentis? Because you are the people who are there when the child wakes up in the middle of the night, not the therapist. And you're the people who need to know what to do and how to deal with things and have support to be able to do it. That's right. So... Um, <laughs> Real sorry, so real therapeutic parenting, uh, real therapeutic fostering. So this is kind of what we're looking at here. So there's a real wraparound service that should be happening. And those of you that were, are fostering now will recognize, and I know we have some people on here tonight from True Fostering and Safer Fostering who do have this kind of service, but you know that what you need is support. Now, when we talk about support, Sarah and I get very annoyed about um, people talking about support when it's not meaningful. Support is only useful if it's meaningful to you, okay? Uh, it, it can't be someone else's idea of support. It needs to be what you think is useful. So one of the things that we found in our research about um, block care and compassion fatigue is that one of the main things that helps us as therapeutic parents is simply having somebody who really understands the life that we lead and listens without judgment, without jumping in with strategies, just listens mm -hmm. and gets it and mm -hmm. really empathises with you. So uh, one of the key things we'll have is an empathic listener, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we also have in a, in a, a therapeutic parenting fostering agency so you'd have a obviously a supervising social worker that you you need for your regulations and your uh, and all the help wonderful work they do um but we would also be providing a children's support worker because we feel that you know you need someone who knows the children who will babysit because sometimes your friends might not want to <laughs> anymore <laughs> they might have, they might have been up at the beginning um sarah certainly helps with reflective practice which we're going to be talking about in a moment um, so this support goes right the way around the family. Training is obviously absolutely key. So yeah. in a moment, we've got a slide on each one of these things and talk about the whole team working and why we have a proactive uh, approach. So this is the kind of thing that we not only believe that you need, but we know that you need, because this is the kind <coughs> of uh, model that we use in the agencies that we, we work in. And, and we know it works. And we know, we it, know works. it works. It's not just a fanciful idea. It tried and tested and absolutely works and, and promotes amazing stability within families. And that's one of the main uh, differences, because I know as a former foster parent and also as an adopter, there's nothing more stressful than when things start getting wobbly and the child might move unexpectedly. It's although it's tragic for the child and it is, it's tragic for the parents as well and the family and maybe there's birth children or adopted children in the home as well. And that's often really overlooked. You know, nobody goes into fostering because they fancy an easy life. You know, that nobody does that. Even going to fostering because it's a true vocation and they want to help to heal children. And so those, yeah, and just to add, Sarah, people who go into fostering uh, for the money, 
for a career uh, don't last more than six months because they soon realise by the end of the month, you know, there's no money because you spent it all on replacing all the broken stuff, cleaning all the mess off the carpet and, uh, you know, whatever else that you've Extra had. The extra insurance and uh, replacing your broken glasses and all the stuff that's been nicked. So, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the money. And we also know of many, many foster parents who've given up very well paid careers to foster. Yeah, it is a true vocation. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, key people that you need to have, and if you are already sitting there feeling a bit panicky and thinking, well, you know, I haven't got any of that, and it's no wonder I'm feeling a bit rubbish. Some of these things you can source yourself, you know, or ask your supervising social worker, or, um, you know, maybe a group you get together and, and ask the uh, manager. These are all within our books, by the way. Um, this particular model, the true model, is described within the very first book we ever did, which was Therapeutic Parenting in a Nutshell. So uh, it's all tried and tested. So, but you could get an empathic listener. You could source somebody there who's a friend, or uh, another foster parent, somebody who, who really does get it. The important thing is that you ask that they are trained alongside you so that they're getting the same information that you get. And most good agencies will agree to that so that you're not feeling that you are, you know, speaking to someone who doesn't have a clue. Um, so the empathic listener's job helps the therapeutic foster parent to think straight and to access strategies. Because what we found is that you know those days when it all blows up and, you know, many of you have a lot of those days at the moment and you, you, it was all getting on top of you. And certainly if you have more than one child, you know, one child does this and then the next child tries to drown the other child in the bath and then the other child makes an allegation. And then before you know it, you're just literally firefighting all the time. When you uh, go to, when you feel like, I, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to have? Gonna, a lot of it is about feeling really terrible. and what we know is that you just need to be able to say to somebody, I have had a terrible day. Mm. I've had a terrible day. And when you speak and when you talk about that and the other person listening to you is truly empathic and truly understands what you're talking about, gradually there's a chemical change within your brain and your the stress levels go down and then you are able to access your own strategies. 99 mm. times out of 100, you don't need somebody to tell you what to do. You don't need somebody to tell you what the strategies are, but you do need just that moment to be able to just say it all, talk it all through, and then say, oh, oh, I see what happened here. Um, and that's really important. Sarah, do you want to just talk about this bit? Um, yes. So you've got to have a team who understand the impact of compassion fatigue. Um, <clears throat> The main thing that I want to say here, and I know we're going to be touching on it shortly, but I just want to bring it up that it's a whole team approach. The team need to understand the impact of compassion fatigue, because if you go on compassion fatigue training, you understand what it's like to be in block care. You understand what it's like to get no reward from what you're doing. You understand what it feels like that when your child walks in the room, the heckles rise on your back. You're not recognizing yourself anymore. But if you haven't got a team around you who understand that, unfortunately, what usually happens is the blame game. People are going to start saying, well, what's wrong with you? You know, what did we not pick up in your assessment? Why are you feeling like this? What can we do? Or start offering strategies that are of no use to you, because at that moment, you can't actually access your strategies because your empathy is switched off. So you need a team who've been trained in understanding the impact of compassion fatigue that will come around you and support you and understand and empathise and put in a support package to help you to move out of compassion fatigue. Mm. so important isn't it because it's a bit like say you've just been in a car crash and then somebody comes along and you think they're going to help you and they start giving you strategies about how you can avoid a crash next time mm. you're, you're not you're, you're not able to you're, you're thinking how the hell am I going to get the car off the motorway and you know and someone's saying well you shouldn't have done that and if you'd have braked earlier you know and that's the kind of way that we feel like you just need someone first of all to reassure you that you're safe and to make sure you're okay much like we do with our children to be honest yeah yeah um, and, and it needs to be someone who understands i mean i think we've all been at the other end of um somebody telling us 
oh, I know how you feel and I understand. And you know that they do not understand. So when I've had people say that to me, I, I put on my happy face and say, oh, are you an adopter? Or, oh, did you foster? Oh, I didn't realise that. And I'll say something like, well, no, no, but I've got teenagers. Like, yeah, no, that's not the same. And I do like a bit of a sad, disappointed face. But it's, uh, it's not the same. Um, so when I do the training with social workers, if I have people that say to me, well, you know, we're parents, so we do get what it's like. What I do is I say to them, I just want you to close your eyes for 10 seconds. And I get them to all close their eyes. And then I say, right now, open your eyes. Right now, you all know what it's like to be blind, don't you? And of course, they are, well, you know, no. I said, no, you don't. And in the same way, you don't know what it's like to live with children from trauma because it is nothing like living with securely attached children. Absolutely not. Okay. So, um, yeah. so, so, um, therapy parenting training, uh, that's obviously really important, our stepping stones. That. So one of the things we believe in, don't we, Sarah, is about whole team training. So with Inspire now, when we go out and do training, we will only train um, foster parents alongside social workers, uh, team managers and that kind of thing. Do you want to just explain why that is, Sarah? Well, yeah, it's vitally important. I'm glad you put the word whole in capital letters because it's so important. Because otherwise what happens is you start training all the, all the foster parents and they get it and they're running with it and they love it. And then you find out that the people around you, social workers, managers, even the admin team, haven't got a clue. And, and then you've got this, you know, you're rubbing against each other all the time. And, and so we firmly believe, you know, it's this thing about, well, I'm the manager, so I understand it all anyway is wrong you know we've got to all be open to increase our knowledge and develop our practice and so nowadays you know we really do want to make sure that we've got it's a top-down approach if you like and I'm, I'm not saying that you're lesser but i'm saying from management down mm. even the chief execs you need we need everybody on board on the same page otherwise you are you're pushing against the system all the time and yeah. that's why we need the whole team to be trained in therapeutic parenting, the whole team. So that's what we're doing in Spire now. So if we've ever booked to go <coughs> on train some foster parents, we always say, well, you know, we need to train social workers, we need to train the managers, and we won't go out and just train foster parents on their own because otherwise, say for example, we might come in and train you all about, um, you know, say for example, something really obvious, like we don't use reward charts and why we don't use reward charts and why we use visual timetables. Well, that's only useful if, then the management team, the social workers, the admin team are behind that and say, oh, yes, uh, we, we're going to stop telling you to use reward charts. We, we're going to issue you with visual timetables. Um, if we've taught you all about reward charts, and visual timetables, and then you're up against a team that say, no, no, we've always done this and therefore we'll always do it. There is nowhere to go with that. No. Um, we are fundamentally, our level two course in... Um, therapeutic parenting actually now this is embedded within our new therapeutic fostering assessment and it starts off literally with why children from trauma do the things they do it's like a lit it's a, a very beginning first step about an introduction to developmental trauma and astonishingly um, this is not included in the majority of social work training so I, we know that often foster parents will say to us well you know I, things got really bad and so then I went and asked a social worker and most of the social workers in the fostering and adoption, I'm a former social worker myself, so I, I do understand this. They've gone off and they've got additional training. So quite often they will know what they're talking about. But the people that have come straight out of university and are on the front line, um, you know, maybe the children's social worker, they are often really not aware about the impact of trauma on children, on their memory and all that kind of thing. So it can be a very lonely place for us as uh, the parents, I think. Um, and they need to know about the impact of developmental trauma. And that's very much minimised. I mean, I still hear people say now, well, he was removed at the age of one, so he won't remember anything. And therefore, as if that could possibly be true. If any of you have been told that and want to know more about that, lots of resources on the NATP website. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Definitely not true. <laughs> Absolutely. If I could just add something briefly here, and yeah. that is that often in fostering, you're given 
you know, you're telling your social worker what the child is doing and asking the social worker, well, how do I deal with this? Well, what really must happen uh, throughout fostering is that we understand why the child is behaving that way, because we know that the why informs the how. When we really understand why they're doing it, then we can put in the right plan of action to help. Yeah. <clears throat> um, a lot of this relies on you having really good effective strategies. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that sometimes looking after children from trauma is overwhelming, not only for foster parents and adopters, but also for social workers, therapists, um, teachers, particularly that we work with as well. And sometimes the tendency is to minimise everything and blame the parents and say, mm -hmm. well, you know, they're fine at school and uh, therefore it's something you're doing wrong. Uh, you might be saying, you might be experiencing, for example, uh, very high levels of child to parent violence. And if they're not seeing that at school, they might just say, well, you know, we don't see it. And it's almost like we don't see it, therefore it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what we find is that by accepting this is a thing and then really looking at it and thinking, how do we stop this what can we put in place you know to make sure that we're tackling child parent violence head on so that we're reducing it right from the outset and we find that that's a much better way of going on rather than putting our head in the paper bag and pretending that you know it doesn't exist and, and the foster parents probably making it up so we've got to have all those um, effective stresses we've got to understand about allegations where they come from why they happen and deal with them sensibly in a grown-up way not in a knee-jerk rushing around hysterically kind of way um exactly so, yeah so so we're, we're very hot on all of that as well and any good true therapeutic parenting uh fostering agency will also understand about child parent violence where it comes from the triggers for it how they can reduce it and mm -hmm. where allegations come from and how to manage them effectively so mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of work with that at the moment with central government to try and change the regulations um, mm -hmm. around um, allegations and those of you who have been on our website you will see that we have developed the warm pack if any of you are experiencing allegations at the moment and you don't know where to turn and everything's very difficult, you can get a warm pack from us free of charge, which is the Wilkins Allegation Response Management Pack. It tells you what to do, what to expect and what happens, no jargon. Um, so you can get that. I'm sure Rosie will share the details with you um, later on. So many people do a reactive approach uh, and we prefer, a therapeutic parent does a, does a proactive one. So, Sarah, do you want to start this one off about some of the innovative tools that we might be using? Mm. So often, unfortunately, in, in many uh, foster agencies, what happens is, as I say, there's got to be a fire going on before uh, you can get the, a bit of help or support to try and understand your child or to... Um, keep your child with you so it's reactive you know they're reacting when there's a problem but mm. what we want to do is we want to preempt those things we want to be proactive we want to put things in place as soon as your child comes to live with you so that you're already informed about what behaviors you might see in the child what might come ahead for you what might be uh, what what you might expect when they move in so you've already got this plan you're already um pre-warned if you like and prepared mm. so we will be using these innovative tools that we've designed uh, myself jane mitchell sarah and Aisha have written some tools for supporting professionals to help you as equal professionals mm. which is the way that we definitely see you uh, to identify those issues before they arise and i think the helpful thing we can say here to any social workers watching who are really very committed to trying to improve their practice and wanting to work in a more proactive way because I can assure you that no social worker goes off to train to be a social worker to annoy people. No. Uh, the, the, the most you know, social workers will train to be social workers because they want to improve children's lives, at, you know, the same as therapists and teachers, all those people. So, um, one of the things that we've done is we've really put our heads together and we've done well you know within our agencies we know that by listening and working and what we do we've developed these tools and we've put them out there and what we see is children stay put foster parents stay put we have very very long-term families and it's lovely mm -hmm. um how can we help 
other agencies and other services to achieve that. So what we've done, we've put all the tools, A, into, we spoke about the introduction at our conference. It's went out to over 30,000 people. I think you can still access that if you want to, where we just do a little overview of all of them. But more importantly, we've also put it into a book, which is coming out in the summer, and it, it gives a step-by-step -step guide to social workers and therapeutic parents about how they can adopt this proactive approach. Now, any of you that have read my book and Sarah's books, you'll know we don't deal in jargon. We don't do lots of airy-fairy nonsense. It's all very practical and very straightforward. So this is no different. So we're very Absolutely. much, you know, I, I think that we want to move away from social workers feeling overwhelmed and parents feeling overwhelmed because mm. I know that if, if a foster parent phones up and says, it's been a nightmare and this is happening, that's happened, that's happened. Do you know, sometimes it's a bit like, oh, I just don't know, as a social, I don't, I don't know where to start with it. Mm. So we wanted to give a roadmap people about yeah. how to actually tackle what looks like very complex behaviors for yeah. us i think we don't find it complex anymore but that's because between us we've got about 70 years combined experience so there's not much that phases us anymore but yeah. um it has been overwhelming and as i mentioned earlier it gives us having a proactive approach means you manage allegations you don't wait for them to to arise mm -hmm. and then you know all run about you actually anticipate when they might happen and if i could just uh, interject here and say that you know we want to empower social workers to support you mm. we really don't want this them and us culture you know i i know many many social workers really truly lovely committed people who just want to do their very best for you but they've not got the tools to do so or mm. they're restricted because they particularly supervising social workers are often caught in the middle they want to support you but the resources aren't there for them to access so we wanted to come up with something that would empower your social workers to help empower you to therefore empower your children and i promise you faithfully the more that we become proactive, we keep children in families long term. It creates stability that is phenomenal because rather than move the problem along because I don't know how to solve it, or we and we get, you know, we get rid of those terms such as the child is breaking down the placement. And actually, we say this child is very distressed in this family. What can we, how can we wrap around them to support them to support their child? And that's why we really want to support the social workers who are supporting you to do so. And don't get me wrong, you know, we also know and have come across some shocking supporting professionals who do not get it, do not want to get it, and do not listen. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some people we can't train. But, um, you yeah, we, know, we've all been there, and I've experienced that myself, I'm afraid. Um, and, you know, having this proactive approach, you stay put, you, ha you achieve job satisfaction. And what is job satisfaction? It's seeing your children heal. And there, there's nothing better than that. Nothing better than seeing, you know, this little child that came in, scared of everything, uh, weeing and pooing everywhere, wouldn't eat, and all the things that, you know, happen, see them become confident human beings who can go move on and achieve themselves in life. So one of the things that obviously we encourage a lot is this reflective practice. And all of those of you who know about therapeutic parenting, who have read any of our books or looked at any of our webinars will know that therapeutic parenting, we rely on the ability of the parent to respond empathically to the child, okay? So, in order for you to be able to respond empathically to the child, you've got to have that capacity. You've got to be able to stop, look at them, think, hmm, what's going on here? Oh, I see. Uh, I think you're feeling a bit wobbly because, or I think you may be struggling because, well, you know, you can only do that if you have somebody more or less doing the same thing with you. If yeah. you've got somebody blaming you and judging you and, you know, being harsh with you, that's just very, very difficult for you to dig deep and find that reflective practice and empathic approach, approach for the child. Yeah. Go on, sir. Agree. And, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we run um, support groups each yeah. month. And, <clears throat> and in those groups, that's where the reflective practice is, to think about how are you? You know, how are the children? How's the whole family? To help you to stop and think and be in the moment and kind of, you know, access those strategies again that are necessary, but also for you to feel very supported by other people who are walking the same road as you. 
and and it's so important that you have those spaces. And of course, at the NATP, there are the lovely listening circles as well. But in a really good therapeutic parenting foster agency, there will be regular face to face support groups that enable you just to feel heard and to feel held. And that's a really important point you make there, Sarah, because we've all been to support groups where they are not safe places. Um, I used to work as a registered manager years ago, but I do know that this still goes on because Foster Parents reported it in our research, where the um, manager said, you know, Foster Parents aren't allowed to gather together without a social worker there because we need to know what they're saying. Um, and then and then the support groups, you know, they, they weren't support at all. It, it was all about, you know, what people were getting paid and how horrible the SSW was and and, um, and I heard one agency refer to it as the Viper's Nest. Well, that's not that's not a support group, is it? And it's yeah. also a very unhappy agency and a very unhappy team. So mm. what the reflect groups are, the, the reflective groups, they're very much facilitated and structured around what's going on in the family, how is the child behaving, why are they behaving? Let's work this out together. So that's the thing that unites us, really. We want to work things out. We want to make things better for us and for our family and for the children um yes. so you know support groups have their place with cake but the reflective groups i think are brilliant they are and also we you know it's important to have social workers child support workers even the admin team at the, at the support groups so that we're all on the same page we've got to get re remove that them and us stuff and if you feel fearful about sharing something then clearly there's a problem there because mm. because you've got to have that absolute open honest dialogue uh, within the whole team definitely so um just to complete the jigsaw puzzle you know what we have in our therapeutic agencies is we have a obviously this ssw supervised social worker and the children's uh, support worker and our children's support workers they tend to be people who are they're usually trained up to level three or they do that with us um, sometimes they're student social workers, but more often they're actually children who've grown up in a family that fostered, something like that. So, so they're really good at connecting to children who are in the care system. Um, and these social workers and the children's support worker work really closely together. Obviously, in our agencies, the SSWs are trauma trained, so they do all the same training as the uh, foster parents. Um, and they also have the opportunity to do the level three diploma in um, therapeutic parenting, which is important. And of course, is trained up to understand compassion fatigue and how to talk to, well, spot compassion fatigue, how you spot a foster parent when they're like, you know, I've had enough, it's all too difficult, how to deal with that and how to speak to you. Because what we do when we train our social workers is say to them, if you go straight into problem solving mode, and telling them what they should and shouldn't be doing, you're just going to drive a wedge in your relationship. We've got a lovely little role play and a video that we use to explain that to uh, social workers. And um, I know that many of us have experienced that, but the compassion fatigue research, it's all out there. And we know that compassion fatigue runs at around 48 to 50% um, in uh, foster, foster parents in the UK. So, you know, it's not like it's a small problem. And compassion fatigue is that bit where you feel really sort of disconnected from the child, like you don't really like them anymore and uh, things are very difficult, but you feel perhaps you can't say that because maybe they'll move the child or um, maybe they're not going to work through things through with you. So understanding the impact of compassion fatigue and more importantly, how to get rid of it is a crucial part of the therapeutic parenting fostering agency. Mm -hmm. Do you want yeah. to talk about the CSW? Yeah, well, the, the CSW will give practical support and assistance to you so that you, you can have a bit of a break sometimes. You know, they'll take the child out to the park, that sort of stuff. They'll do creative activities with the children. Sometimes, if it's not appropriate for you to take the child to contact, the, because it's too distressing for the child, the child support worker will take your child. Um, there's so many different things. I mean, you, you really would find that they are invaluable to, to you. It's so important to have that, that person in your life. And they, for the child, it's like a, an extended family member and, and just a person for them. Um, mm -hmm. And you work together 
it's not just about you know child and child support worker they become a support to you in a practical in a practical way um the other thing that i think just very quickly i want to mention i know we haven't got a lot of time so is right. that when a child comes in as well it isn't about you know is this the right child for your family it's about are you the right family for this child uh, and there's very, very careful matching, very, very careful matching, uh, not just, you know, oh, here's a space, here's a foster parent who's got a bed, let's put the child there. We're really going to think in, in many ways about how appropriate this family is for this child, which is quite mm. different. It is. I, I think the other thing that's really good about the CSW is that we all know, don't we, these days that Children's social workers come and go very, very quickly. This, the system is broken. It, it's, it's terrible in some areas that we go and work in and uh, social workers are under a lot of pressure and they resign, you know, they leave and, and go. So the children's support worker, I think children connect to them really well because they don't have power. And there's that real unhelpful dynamic, isn't there, Sarah, where, you know, we know that the, the child's social worker is there for the child, but the child also knows that is a very powerful person who can move them. Well, the yeah. children's support worker can't move the child. They, they yeah. don't have that. So their anxieties aren't high. When the children's social worker comes to visit, they can play computer games. They can play Monopoly. They can go out for burger. There's no agenda. Uh, a lot of it is around giving you a break, babysitting, uh, helping them with their home, especially at the moment. Our CSWs are very busy because, of course, um, they're supporting parents with children at home. So it's really handy to, to have that. And, you know, uh, and so they tend to work after school hours and in the evenings and that kind of thing. And um, I, I, found, I found them to be absolutely fantastic. Um, whole team working, which Sarah touched on a bit earlier on, um, what we use in um, our, the agencies we work with most closely is the true model and true means um, therapeutic reparenting underpinned by empathy. And that's in the nutshell book um, so that describes the team around the child your supervisor social worker your children support worker your empathic listener and your therapist who is trauma informed and is supporting the parents to be able to use therapeutic parenting with the children so that's a whole team around the child and everyone's on the same page and everyone's working together one of the other things that we do is we use the brand new therapeutic fostering assessment. Um, we believe that the full method is outdated and uh, we don't use it anymore because it started to get a bit silly where we are now assessing the state of your uh, fire alarms rather than can you look after this child and what are your particular skill sets and do you know about developmental trauma and if you don't, can we teach you about developmental trauma? So the therapeutic fostering assessment looks at motivation, looks at expectations, and all the training, which is a level two award, is embedded within the assessment. And that's so important because nowadays, social workers, oh my goodness, you have so much to do. You've got, in, in England, you've got PSD uh, to do, you know, the second people of three panel, and those of you that are fostering will know this, uh, you, you have to do stuff on child development same in, in Wales, that I think it's called the four, I mean, Welsh something, I, I should know because I've got a Welsh agency, but it's the same, it's the framework. And your foster parents there, they have to do um, exactly the same. So you've got skills to foster, you've got the TSD, you've got um, the assessment to get through. So what we've done is we've done uh, some really great focus groups. We've talked to foster parents, we've talked to social workers, and we've got rid of all the stuff that we don't need there's not in yes. the regulations we we don't do risk assessments on goldfish anymore do we <laughs> <laughs> we don't do risk assessments on goldfish or anything like that um, um we we also use a trauma tracker don't we sarah yeah yeah. So um, we have devised some tools that will help, really help to 
um, ensure that you can preempt uh, behaviours that you might see and also uh, minimise allegations or understand allegations differently through the lens of the child's history. So I came up with an idea called the Trauma Tracker and, and our lovely Jane Mitchell very kindly uh, wrote the tool for us and has used it, is using it in the agency very, very much. And what it does, it, it comes along with the child, it's like a spreadsheet that tells you um, what the child has been through, the dates that the child went through, that it maps all the changes in the child's life. And it will have things like, um, you know, the date that I first came into care, the date that my dad died, that kind of stuff, so that you will always be able to preempt little Johnny might be really wobbly next week because he's got an important date coming up. And as we know, these things are really stored inside the children and can easily be triggered. Uh, the trauma the tracker will move. Ball, doesn't it, really? Pardon? It gives you a crystal ball, doesn't it? Really? It gives you a crystal ball. It really helps you to, uh, in order to look forward or even to look at today, you have to do it through the lens of yesterday. And mm. that's what the trauma tracker enables us to do. Yeah. Uh, then I wrote uh, the Developmental Foundation Planner, which are the cornerstones of therapeutic parenting. We always talk about the fact that because with developmental trauma disorder, our children are emotionally, developmentally much younger than the biological age. So we often say, you know, an unmet need remains unmet until it's met. Well, how do we do that? How do we allow our children to safely regress? How do we know what unmet needs there are for your particular child early nurture that they've missed out on so this tool enables us to in a very bespoke way figure out what your child hasn't had and the behavior will tell us as well as the chronology via the trauma tracker and then we put in a bespoke plan for your child using the developmental foundation planner so what we what we uh, want to make sure you're aware of here which is really important is that if you feel you're walking in treacle, we now have developed and piloted, well, the, assess the therapeutic foster assessment is just finishing the pilot and it's had rave reviews from people being assessed, uh, social workers doing assessments much quicker, six to eight weeks, no repetition, ADMs very happy with it, panels thrilled with it, very clear documentation. Um, so what we're, we are able to come and do training, we do it on Zoom and we can help agencies to swap over to this very easily and it actually cuts down a lot of the work that's being done alongside. So um, if you feel that you're in an agency that would benefit from it, just you know, contact Rosie and she will um, make sure you get the right information. Mm -hmm. um, last but not least, we have the BET and the BET is a tool which I've developed, which is basically used for uh, when, you, when you have difficult behaviours that come up and you're thinking, you know, what, what am I going to do? We call it spark. So, you know, things have been going okay and then suddenly things are going a bit haywire. And it's a tool that the social worker or empathic listener can work alongside you over four to six sessions, very structured. Let's look at what's going on. Let's look at the ACE of therapeutic parenting. What is the behaviours? How can we address it? Let's put the plan in. Did it work? What do we need to change? It's really straightforward, really good. And it's also really good for if you've got a social worker who doesn't really know developmental trauma or is quite new or newly qualified, it teaches them it all as they go along. So and it, Yes, and it picks up compassion for T, doesn't it, Sarah? What does yeah, BET stand for? What do the letters stand oh, do you for? You know what? I was actually just sitting here trying to remember it. And I was <laughs> Because I, because I have behavioral assessment intervention intervention resolution tool. That's it. Yeah, I knew it was behavioral assessment um, uh, intervention resolution tool. Thank you, Sarah. Because I looked at it and I thought, oh, I've got a bit of a blank there. But um, it, and and I think that's because sometimes what we found in social work teams is when a foster parent phones up and says he's doing this again, the instinctive response from a social worker who feels like they're not quite sure what to do can be to withdraw and to start blaming or, you know, minimising. If they've got the bet, they go, all oh, right, we need to start using this. And they can get in there alongside you and listen and start working out with you. So, uh, yes, and we don't do risk assessments on goldfish or sheds or, uh, yeah, or, you know, we, we basically move into a position where foster parents are treated as therapeutic foster parents, co-professionals, uh, having a clue and working alongside us together to um, get the best outcomes for children. 
The, um, I know we spoke briefly about the fostering agencies. So if you're in Wales, uh, Safe for Fostering is our not-for-profit. That stands for Secure Attachments from Empathic Reparenting. So um, I am a director of that agency. I'm very involved putting in everything. And in England, it's True Fostering, which stands for Therapeutic Parenting Underpinned by Empathy. And that's based very much on the uh, true model, obviously, uh, within the um, nutshell book. So, um, but any training you need, if you're watching from an agency today and you're thinking, oh, my agency could do with this, you know, it'd be really great, then Inspire Training uh, will come out. Obviously, I'll be delighted to come out and do face-to-face -face training soon, um, but we can also do it on Zoom for you and help you to pick up some of these things just to help um, everyone to get stable. One of the first things we can do is teach the social workers how to do empathic listening if they're not already doing or if they're struggling with that and how to put that system in place. So, and just quickly, just yeah. very quickly, somebody said, what about Scotland? We're not there yet, but don't worry. We will get there don't eventually. <laughs> we are actually, we're actually speaking to somebody. In the last two days, we've started speaking to somebody in Scotland about putting a not-for-profit fostering agency in Scotland. Um, as part of safer fostering so that that will come it's mm. just that wales has only just started up in the last sort of six months we're already pretty inundated with, with people coming in so we'll we're just gonna you know make sure that's all kind of settled i've run fostering agencies before um true's been going for three or four years now um so uh so yes we definitely come to scotland we'll even come to northern ireland if anybody over there would like to uh i'm not going to move to northern ireland um i'm afraid but um you know what we do is we identify really good key people who understand therapeutic parenting and understand the regulations of that country um and then they head it up for us so um we all work together though across all of it so um so i'm just going to have a look at any questions um oh that's nice lots of people saying thank you I'm in Canada. Oh, hello. Yes, Scotland. <laughs> um, so if you'd like to... Had a couple of people ask about how they can get access to a trauma tracker to share with their social workers. A lot. I've even just received an email straight away. <laughs> yes. Uh, they, now, you can have the tra trauma tracker, but you've got to have the training on it. You know, we can't, you know, everything we're talking about here, the trauma tracker, the therapeutic fostering assessment, the BERT, the cornerstones, we give you training in it. And then we give you the template because what we ha what we know and um, we have found in the past is that if we um, just send out the trauma tracker, people go, oh, we'll just change this. We're just sort of, you know, there are years and years of work that's gone into this and we really do know what we're talking about. So we need to understand, we need people to understand what they're doing uh, with it as they start using it. So, yeah. so in effect, once you've had the training, once your agency has had the training, you're licensed to use it. Um, and that also means if anything pops up or you're a bit worried about, you know, what um, what what you should be doing, uh, we can help you with it if you feel like it's going wrong or something. Um, so, yeah. Because it's re the, these tools have to be used in a very specific manner. So they've got to be well understood before they can be used. Definitely. And in the meantime, if anyone wants... Some information we did share it at our um 2020 conference and it does actually give an example of what it looks like and the training around it and and where we're going with it so do contact us and ask for a copy of the conference because it will give you a bit more of an in-depth conversation around what it is about and those tools like. yeah, yeah. About the tools all the tools one thing i want to say is I've, i have seen it come up a couple of times do you have to do any training um, and, and have qualifications to be classed as a therapeutic foster parent? Well, what we've done um, is uh, in our agencies, all the foster parents are therapeutic foster parents. And the reason for that is because the, the way they are assessed. So instead of doing a, uh, a form F, as I say, they do a therapeutic fostering assessment. So by the time they finish that, which is take six to eight weeks, they've also, uh, it's also, the training is all embedded within it. So you do your introduction to developmental trauma, introduction to therapeutic parenting, 
um, as well as all the stuff about being a professional foster parent and that kind of thing. So that leads directly to um, a level two qualification in therapeutic parenting. So it's not extra work, it just kind of happens organically within the process. So instead of doing a separate skills to foster, which has no relation to the form F, and then a separate TSD, it's all mapped together. So for example, if you've done the therapeutic fostering assessment um, and then you've been through panel, um, what you would do is that we then map in all the stuff that goes in with the TSD. So you don't have to then start a whole new thing on what is child development. So it saves loads of work for the foster parents. So you can get on with actually looking after children, which is what we want you to do. And social workers are free to do social work rather than suddenly becoming um, people marking schoolwork like a college lecturer. So we, we work, we've worked really hard to make sure that people are doing the jobs they wanted to do, the jobs that they chose to do. Hmm. Great, yep. Thank you. And um, just one last question that I saw, it was where, where does TRUE cover? What regions of England does it cover? So well, TRUE... Is SAFER in Wales is, is obvious. Yeah, yeah, so SAFER covers the whole of Wales. So because of electronic working, we, we are really good now at being able to cover everywhere. And same with TRUE, really. Although we've got pockets of, like, you know, density around... East Midlands, West Midlands, um, sort of Swindon, Wiltshire, Somerset, um, Bristol area. Actually, we now have um, inquirers coming up everywhere. So right over towards Norfolk um, and joining up areas like Milton Keynes, Surrey, Sussex, Devon, Cornwall. So what we do is we tend to recruit in people to support you where you are. So, we, so, so really the answer for true is anywhere in England, uh, it's anywhere in England. And because you are automatically a member of NATP, if you're in any of these agencies, then you also obviously are joined into your local listening circle. So you've got that lovely support there straight away, wherever you are. So I think that's um, really yeah. helpful. And just to say that the, the support groups are run via Zoom as well as face-to-face. -face. So if you're in an area where you know, we don't do them face to face. There's always uh, there's Zoom support groups. You'd be very much included.